Hello, my name is Anwar Hassan. I'm one of the senior intensive care unit physiotherapists from Nepean Hospital and today uh, I'm going to talk about humidification and also discuss the importance of humidification therapy in treating our respiratory patients. So what is humidity? In very simple terms, it is nothing but the measure of water content of air. In other words, humidity is also the amount of moisture held by the air. So this quantity of moisture or water that is held by the air can be expressed in terms of absolute humidity or relative humidity. So absolute humidity is basically the actual amount, whereas relative humidity is basically expressed in terms of actual percentage of moisture that is held by the air. Also to let you know the maximum amount of moisture or water that air can hold is about 44 milligrams per liter which is about 100% moisture or humidity. So what is required for humidification? Air, water and heat. These are the three things that is required for humidification but also note with the increase in heat, humidity increases but also presence of water is equally important. Let's have a look at the mechanism of humidification in our respiratory system. The upper respiratory tract is designed to provide adequate humidification for optimal functioning of our lungs. So, for example, here when we breathe room air, which is around 22 degrees of temperature, the humidity content is around 15% only. But as the air reaches the back of the nose, it's about 31 degrees and the relative humidity is 68%. So it rises quite rapidly. As soon as the air reaches the trachea, you can see the temperature rises to 36. And as I said, with the rise in temperature, humidity also increases and you can see it's about 95% now. Once the air reaches the carina, which is almost the body temperature, 37 degrees, and at 37 degrees, I would like you guys to note that humidification or the, the moisture content is fully saturated. The, 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 the air is fully saturated. So at 37 degrees in our carina, the humidification is about 100%. So now we understood how our our upper respiratory tract provide humidification. Let's have an understanding how it actually does that. So the upper airway is very rich in blood supply and as a result, it's very efficient in heat and moisture transfer. Okay, so the heat and moisture is released very rapidly during inspiration and this causes the nasal mucosa to cool down. When the warm air is coming out during expiratory cycle, okay, it absorbs the heat and moisture back from the air. As a result, the nose or the nasal mucosa feels warm again, but it keeps the heat and moisture ready for the next breath in. Now, let's have a look at uh, the microscopic structure or the lining of our airways and why it is important or how this gets impacted because of inadequate or poor humidification. If you look at the lining of our respiratory tract, we know that it consists of mucociliary system. This mucociliary system comprises of the layers of mucus secreting cells that produces mucus all the time. And the prime function of this mucus is to obviously keeping, keep the um, respiratory system moist so as to trap the dust, the dirt, dead bacteria, viruses, and whatnot. Okay, once that's trapped, this mucociliary system, which constantly beats 24 seven, and it propels this mucus up towards the, towards the upper airway or back of our throat, which we swallow without realizing. This is like a 24 seven cleaning, cleaning up mechanism into our lungs. Let's have a look how humidification is important in this particular cleaning mechanism. So when you look at this ciliary system closely, you will see that there is layer of cilia. On top of that, there's a layer of water. And on top of that, there is a gel layer, which is nothing but the mucus, which is trapping all this dust and dirt and bacteria and virus and whatnot, and any other foreign object or particles. So this particular cilia has to be submerged 
in the water layer to be able to perform and beat at the rate to provide the optimal cleaning function. This, this cilia beats at about 15 times every second and that's what is required for it to, uh, to work optimally. But when the humidification is depleted because of uh, inadequate humidification, breathing cold air or because of dehydration, okay, due to various reasons, what happens is this water layer is depleted and the gel layer, which is the mucus layer, comes and sits on top of the, the cilia. As a result, cilia cannot function anymore, cannot move anymore, or even if it moves, it's not adequate. As a result, what happens is the mucus is not cleared um, on a regular basis, leading to sputum trapping, leading to building up of secretions into our lungs, which is not very good. So let's have a look at what are the reasons why we see inadequate uh, humidification. Okay, so these are the common reasons we come across into our patients. Number one is medical gas, which is very cold and dry. We'll have a look at it once again very quickly to see why, why medical gas is not very good for the patients if it is inhaled just by itself. Another situation where you see inadequate humidification when, when patient is breathing in and out large amounts of air, which means the, the tidal volume is bigger or the respiratory rate is really high. What happens is because of the large amount of air going in and out of our system, our mucosa, which is in our nose and upper respiratory tract, cannot cope with providing humidification to this large amount of air. And as a result, um, our humidification is often inadequate to our, to our airways and our lungs. Uh, another example where you see inadequate humidification where the upper airway is bypassed, such as tracheostomies or laryngectomies. So let's have a look at medical gas um, and in and, and comparison to the room air and also uh, its comparison to the humidified oxygen. So medical gas, as you would know, is, is, is compressed and usually stored in a liquid form and the temperature is very low. It's around five degrees. At that temperature, the relative humidity is very, very low. It's around one to two percent only. And that is, we know for the fact, is not adequate. In comparison, if you see room air where the temperature is around 22 to 24 degrees, the relative humidity is only 15%. That's also not adequate, but we talked about the function of our upper respiratory mucosa. It can provide humidity. It can take care of humidification at that temperature. But in patients who are inhaling medical gas or they're breathing at a very fast rate, our mucosa cannot cope with that. So we require humidification therapy, and if this medical gas is humidified at 37 degrees, the humidity reaches 100%, which is the ideal situation, which is what we should be doing. Don't take my word for it. Have a look at this paper. Okay, this recent published, recently published study uh, found that colder air can cause mucociliary clearance system dysfunction big time. It not only reported that, but it also found that inhaling colder air can, can reduce the tracheal temperature quite significantly and also increase amount of ventilation or increase respiratory rate can further lower the tracheal temperature. So in this particular study, they, they asked people to breathe a, a 20, a air which was at 20 degrees temperature and that caused a lowering of the temperature down to 31 degrees. But Imagine the patient's breathing um, cold, dry uh, oxygen, which is at five degrees. And if they're in respiratory distress and breathing really, really fast, you can imagine the tracheal temperature. Definitely, the humidification is not going to be adequate. No wonder why these guys spit and plug, why they have respiratory distress, why they have retained airway secretion, and they have difficulty clearing secretions as well. So that's when it becomes very, very important for us to consider humidification in those patients. So just to sum it up, um, the, the results or, or, or adverse effects of inadequate humidification. Number one, we talked about it, impaired mucociliary function, which is at the microscopic level in our airways, which can lead to thicker secretions and that can result into airway obstruction. Starts with smaller airway obstruction and it can also lead to sput and plugging of larger airways. We also see as a result, lots of lobar atelectasis, poor gas exchange, which can lead to further respiratory distress, and also in patients who've got tracheostomy or laryngectomy tubes, it can lead to obstruction of the stoma, 
which is which can sometimes be a medical emergency. So how, how, how do we provide uh, humidification or adequate humidification? Unfortunately, we won't be able to cover this in this particular presentation. That will be covered elsewhere. But I just wanted to give you a very quick example of the types of humidifiers. So types of humidifiers, it can be broadly classified into two types, active humidifiers and passive humidifiers. A very good example of active humidifier would be Aero device. So as you see, the Evo device is a very commonly used device these days. In the last five to seven years, it has become very popular and now it is almost a, a ward-based therapy. Um, it, it, it can not only provide adequate humidification, but it can also guarantee the targeted um, FiO2 and also targeted airflow. So it's got some extra um, uh, added features which uh, which is beneficial to our patients. But if you don't have access to Evo, there's some simple heated humidifiers available as well and they can do a pretty good job of providing good humidification. Um, only thing is that they cannot guarantee any airflow um, or any targeted uh, FiO2. But I wanted to talk about these nebulizers. There is a misconception among some people that nebulizers can provide humidification. I wanted to tell you, let you know that humidification cannot be provided by nebulizers because the air supply that is used to run these humidifiers remains at the same lower temperature. It is not heated, which means it cannot pick up any extra moisture, hence it cannot provide humidification. It is a good drug delivery device and it should just be used for that. It is not a good substitute for humidification. So this is the end of the presentation and I hope we were able to clarify some concepts around humidity and also importance of humidification therapy. Thank you.